A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. That's according to a Chinese proverb. That journey can't be an entire lifetime. A study in 2020 showed that the average adult walks about 75,000 miles during their existence here on Earth. So maybe that journey of a thousand miles reflects certain periods of our life. For example, my current journey of a thousand miles includes taking care of my wife and two kids, writing the Big Stories podcast, and trying to find time to walk more instead of just sitting around and typing scripts at my desk. Bill Story's journey of a thousand miles is a bit different. He would love to take just one step under his own power again. When he was much younger, he used to be able to run and block the big guys in front of him as an offensive lineman for the Southern Illinois Salukis football team. He was a big man that could move and had a power base to stop a defender. But Bill's current goal is to saunter onto the Saluki Stadium field one more time. I just want to get there first. (laughs) It won't be easy because Bill barely has any legs. That hasn't stopped him from walking. If I hadn't been present for it, I almost wouldn't really believe it. I know I'll probably never see that again. Beyond impressive. This is BYU Radio's Big Stories, telling the amazing and inspiring tales from the Big 12 and beyond. I'm Cleon Wall. In this episode, Bill's story's thousand-mile journey to taking one single step. I'm here to visit with Bill Story. Okay. I am 4402. My journey to telling Bill Story's story begins in Gainesville, Florida. He lives in a fourth-story apartment not far from his son, Deke. Come on. Hello, my friend. Okay, I was just getting ready here downstairs. Oh, I'm glad you didn't. (laughs) Okay. Come on in. How are you doing? Bill backs his wheelchair into his apartment and allows me to set up my recording equipment on his little dining room table, which is one step from the kitchen. If you go a step in another direction, you're almost next to his bed. His domicile is small and simple. It's just the way he likes it. I didn't need a lot of space, and um, it does get kind of tight, like going in that bathroom there, but, uh, <laughs> but it worked out real good. As soon as I sit down, Bill wants me to know that he is a God-fearing man attending online services with the New Olivet Worship Center in his boyhood home of Memphis, Tennessee. It also has helped me to develop my spirituality and everything. You know, I've made some some changes in my life since I've been at that church. And he has no problem showing pride for his alma mater, Southern Illinois University. He's wearing a gray SIU t-shirt and a pair of baggy gray shorts. Those shorts cover the entirety of what's remaining of his legs. Bill is also wearing a big smile on his face. You can barely see his eyes when he's flashing those pearly whites. So I ask him why he's always smiling after losing his ability to walk. I mean, it's been a complete, real challenge and ordeal. And just going through it, I looked at it one or two ways. If you remember in the Shawshank Redemption movie, And uh, Morgan Freeman made that statement. He said, you got to either get busy living or get busy dying. And that's the way I look at it. To understand how Bill's story overcame a double amputation and got busy living again, you have to go back to his first journey of a thousand miles, when he was growing up in Memphis. Orange Mound was one of the oldest black communities that had businesses going uh, in the nation. And... uh, And uh, it was me, my mother and father, and my sister, just the four of us. We lived about two blocks over from the elementary and high school. A lot of us that lived in those certain zones got a chance to go to that one school 12 years. We ended up being involved in the 12 Year Society. This is where Bill learned to play football. We had street teams, Mm -hmm. and we would play each other. We would play championships. Like uh, Seller Street is where I live. We would play Dallas Street, or we might play Hamilton Street, and we will meet somewhere and play each other. He then started playing for Melrose High School in the ninth grade, but quit after his freshman season. I just figured, well, I like music better, so I was gonna go to music. And when I actually decided to do that, the coach that I had, he told me that, you know, big old story, you don't want to play football, you just want to be a big old thug. I mean, he talked about me bad every day. And uh, I even got where I would go around the gym 
and wouldn't even go through the gym. And uh, so anyway, I went back out in the 11th grade and I played. The football coach saw the makings of a great player, but that doesn't mean he took it easy on Bill or his teammates. High school was completely tough. And uh, I mean, it was tougher than college or in professional because they had a coach, a coach that in July and August, we would practice eight hours a day. The Golden Wildcat football players entered the stadium at 7 a.m. and the coach locked the gate behind them. He was kind enough to give Bill and his teammates a break for lunch, but Bill didn't want to hang around the stadium during his downtime. I had one of my classmates, he, he, he lived across the street from the stadium. So his parents had air conditioning. But the only way for us to get out to go over there during a the lunch break, we had to climb over this 10-foot fence to get there. <laughs> so we would do that, go up to his house and just lay in the floor and come back and go back to practice. We lost the city championship three to nothing after that first year. My coach told me, Bill, he said, last year we practiced eight hours a day with an hour lunch break and lost one game. He said, next year we're going to practice nine hours with a half hour lunch break and we're going to win every game. And uh, <laughs> the next year, that's what we did. Freaking lost to the same team the next year <laughs> in the city championship. In two short years, the six foot three lineman made an impression on college football coaches. He committed to Tennessee State along with a few of his friends. Then he took a recruiting visit to Carbondale, Illinois, and the campus of Southern Illinois University. After I had gone up to SIU and I saw that, I just liked it. It seemed like it was more modern, modernizing everything. Bill's second 1,000-mile journey commenced when he enrolled at SIU and became a Saluki football player. Other Memphis natives also matriculated up the Mississippi River to southern Illinois. Everything seemed to be in Bill's favor. He was on a nice new campus with guys he knew from his hometown. But something wasn't right. SIU didn't feel like home. At that time, we went there, it was 14% black. I had come out of a high school that was all black the whole 12 years, and it was a different culture going to SIU. I had got tired of SIU, and I was ready to go to Tennessee State or Jackson State. And the guy that was my roommate, he said, man, if you don't just love football, ain't no need of you going down to Tennessee State. And I thought about that, and uh, so I changed my mind at that time. Bill focused more on his studies. I really got into what it's going to take for me to get from point A to point B, and point B was to graduate. I would go back to the dorm sometimes, especially when grades come out, and people would see grades, and they would say, how you pull grades like that? Say, you were at the same parties that I was at. But my system was, after football practice or after my last class or whatever, my routine was always, 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 I go straight to the library and do all my work. Okay, so Bill did have fun and attend parties along with studying like crazy, and people were just drawn to him. We were formulated a group of guys of tight buddies, and we call ourselves the party people. Jerry Hardaway was a Saluki tight end and one of Bill's teammates. Of course, Jerry had a different name for the big offensive lineman. Beacon. Story. The thing you got to know in the Southern religions, Baptist religion, the deacons led the church. And so that's part of the way he got that name. He was our leader. And when the old coach would come over and catch us in what we doing, the deacon would represent us over there. Did he represent you well? That's what I want to know. He, he negotiated pretty good. Sometimes he didn't negotiate at all. I came home late about like one o'clock and um, all the coaches were there and they were upset. Bob Tomier is a former SIU linebacker and teammate of Bill's. They assumed that all the white players had a party. Well, Billy comes out of his room. He says, hey, coach, <laughs> it was everybody on the team. So Billy talked everybody in the running um, at 5 a.m. in the morning. I don't know if he demanded respect or he just you respected him from just who he was. And um, he, was, he had some natural leadership about him. 
you know, if you couldn't like Billy, you weren't going to like anybody. And he was a genuine guy. He was always bigger than life in the sense that he was a big statured guy. Uh, but he was always very relatable and cordial and easy to be around. Paulette Change met Bill through a common friend her freshman year at SIU. I thought that I was a fast runner. He thought he was a fast runner. So we had a challenge that I would beat him running down the hallway. And I did take off, and I think I took off faster than him. The mistake that I made is I looked back, and I saw him gaining on me. And at some point, I felt that both of us could not pass in the hallway together. So I ended up really kind of ratcheting back and stopping. Bill was also fast on the football field and talented enough to play both sides of the football. But Big Bill preferred to play offense. It's always a constant thinking process. And the thing, that's one of the things I like about offense. If the defense changes, the calls will change. And if the quarterback changes the play, that'll even change the whole blocking scheme. It was always a chess game. He was a big man that could move and had a power base to stop a defender. And he was mentally smart to know all that he needed to do in the position. Our senior year, and um, you know, we didn't have a very good year, but you could tell Billy was just, that he was gonna play at the next level. And we played Tampa that year, and there was a guy named John Matusik, who ended up being a first round draft choice. And he was, um, Billy was playing against him. And, you know, when you're on defense, you're not really watching the offense too much, but took notice of, I mean, Billy, Billy handled them real easy. And it kind of set him apart. And I think that's probably one of the reasons Billy probably got drafted. Bill's next thousand mile journey, professional football. When we come back, Bill's story succeeds in football and life, then one step changes everything. This is Big Stories from BYU Radio. We here at BYU Radio not only like telling good stories from around the Big 12, but also stories about the BYU Cougars. So if you want to find out more about the Cougars clad in blue, you can check out the Deep Blue podcast. It's hosted by Jason Shepard. You'll hear from both past and present BYU athletes and coaches. They open up about their personal journeys, challenges, and triumphs. Deep Blue offers a unique glimpse into the lives of these remarkable individuals, showcasing sides of them you won't find anywhere else. It's a podcast that not only brings you closer to the Cougars, but also uplifts and inspires with every episode. Don't miss out. Download and subscribe to Deep Blue wherever you get podcasts, or you can always find it on the BYU Radio app. Welcome back to BYU Radio's Big Stories. This is Bill Story's Thousand Mile Journey to Taking One Single Step. Bill Story was a standout offensive lineman for the Southern Illinois Salukis in the late 60s and early 70s. Bill was the kind of guy that uh, you can lean on him. Former Saluki teammate Jerry Hardaway said, Bill was a team leader and one of the friendliest and happiest guys you will ever meet. His next stop, the National Football League. In the 1973 NFL Draft, there were 17 rounds, and Bill was picked almost in the middle of it. I got a call from Hank Stram, and he was a member at the head coach in Kansas City at the time. And they drafted me, so, you know, I started preparing for that. I remember when he was drafted by the Kansas City Chiefs, and that really came as a surprise to me because I didn't think in that way. Paulette Change is a friend of Bill's from his college days at SIU. I didn't understand that most college football players wanted to be drafted by a team, and I didn't see him that way because he didn't behave that way. He never touted his greatness or anything like that. Story didn't have a storied rookie season. An injury prevented him from playing one snap. And before the start of the second season, the players went on strike. Chiefs head coach Hank Stram called Bill and asked him to cross picket lines. This could have been Bill's chance to show off his skills and potentially start, but Bill told Coach Stram he first wanted to talk to his agent. This was a Tuesday. He calls me back on a Thursday morning, two days later. So, and when he called me back, well, I told him I was gonna stay out. And at that particular time, the last words that he told me that day was, Bill, I think it's a shame for you to throw away an opportunity like this. And 
but he don't know. I got to practice against these guys that I've already spent a year with. And so I I stayed out, walked the picket line, and uh, and I noticed they had people going around taking pictures of everybody on the picket line. So I know this ain't going to be good. The Chiefs cut Bill right before the start of the season, but his playing days weren't done. He first survived a short stint in the short-lived World Football League. The first thing I heard when I walked in the locker room was, if we don't get no money, we ain't going to play. The league eventually folded. Then Bill taught at a probation school in Illinois. And I hated the job, too. That's when the Chiefs signed him to come back and play in Kansas City. Under new coach Paul Wiggin, he learned to play four of the five offensive line positions and gave his all on special teams. Then he got his big break. Nick, the guy that was playing the right tackle, the starter, he hurt his knee in warm-ups. So I had to start. That start would come against Pittsburgh's famed Steel Curtain defense. There's L.C. Greenwood, there's Dwight White, there's Joe Green, and uh, all of them on that side. Steve Furness was the other defense lineman. So now you think about this time, I'm like 24 years old at that time. So all of a sudden now, I got to start. <laughs> and I hadn't started a game yet. Then I started thinking that, well, this is my opportunity here, my time. So I got out there, and I had probably one of the best games I ever had. Bill proved he could play in the NFL and hoped to do great things the following season with the New Orleans Saints. Hank Stram had been named the new coach of the team, and Bill wanted to play for his former coach and protect Archie Manning alongside Conrad Dobler. He was named the most dirtiest offensive lineman in football, and I just had a dream of playing with this guy. So I was calling down there, and I was wanted to get traded to uh, New Orleans. Well, Hank told me that it was nothing they could do until Kansas City released me. They held on to me all through the preseason, wouldn't let me play during the preseason. Mm -hmm. Then when they released me, was right at the beginning of the season when everybody had set their rosters. His NFL career was now officially over. After finishing the 1976 season with the Edmonton Eskimos of the Canadian Football League, Bill hung up his football cleats for good. He decided it was time to move on to the next 1,000-mile journey. His first step, teaching school and coaching the game he loved. He then shifted to restaurant and store management because it paid better. All the while, Bill was helping to raise his two sons. The younger of the duo was named Deke, just like the nickname Bill received in college. He was a great dad. He made me work hard, uh, made me finish the job. Uh, there were times where I did not want to play football, um, and he wouldn't allow me to quote-unquote punk out. Um, you know, would and that was more or less uh, a mind game to let me know that I was uh, not being as tough as I should have been. Deke followed in his father's footsteps, playing offensive line in college. I was lucky enough to uh, win a national title um, at the University of Florida, and um, I was on a team that was uh, that won uh, four SEC championships in a row. Deke now teaches and coaches kids not to punk out at Gainesville High School. I'm a, I teach driver's ed and hope fitness, PE, and um, I coach weightlifting and volleyball. Um, love Gainesville. Um, don't have any plans on leaving for right now. Uh, it's just awesome place, as you can see. Bill only joined Deke in the north central Florida city out of necessity. He had a fall in Memphis. A friend of his called me, and um, he was in pretty bad shape. But before we get to Bill's almost deadly tumble, we need to go back in time back to a Friday night in 2005 when Bill was managing a Walgreens in Memphis, Tennessee. I was at work in my store and I tripped. I didn't fall all the way down, but I fell forward and uh, I felt like I sprained my ankle. He rested and iced his ankle on Saturday. On Sunday, he got up to go to church. And it's just something wasn't right, wasn't feeling right. So I went over to the hospital in Memphis. They finally came out and told me I had ruptured my Achilles. Bill had surgery to repair the Achilles, but there were complications after it. So he had another procedure, and another one, and another one. By it being a worker's comp case, I had to meet with the independent orthopedic there, 
So when I met with him a couple of times, his last words to me was, Bill is full of infection down there. Bill eventually had his right leg amputated below the knee. He continued to live in Memphis for several more years. One night, he was in his house when an old classmate tried to call him. I couldn't find my phone. I heard it buzzing. I couldn't find it. And I guess at some point, I was down looking for it. So I'm crawling around the floor looking for the phone, and I couldn't find it. And then, darkness. Bill passed out. When he woke up, police officers, firefighters, a couple of neighbors, and his former college roommate were in his house. He had came and I guess peeked through the window and saw me in the house, I guess on the floor. So he went and kicked the back door in. And uh, he came in the house and then went and got them. Matter of fact, I would probably end up dead in Memphis if uh, he, if he wasn't hadn't around, stepped in. If he hadn't stepped in. That's when Deke got the phone call and he insisted on moving his father to Gainesville. His amputated leg wasn't doing so good. They had me feel the leg, and uh, it was cold. And so there was no circulation going there. So they recommended that they would have to do another amputation on the same leg. So we just went ahead and did uh, an above the knee on the right leg. During the process, the left foot started turning colors. Um, the, the one leg that he did have left uh, was basically killing him. It really was. Um, you know, without trying to get too graphic, but just imagine uh, taking a blowtorch to one of your feet, and that's what it more or less looked like. So somehow an infection, I guess, went over to that side. It was easy for me to say, well, that thing's got to go. Um, you know, but it's not me that's sitting in the hospital bed. The thing going through my head was, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked, what options did I have? Only choice, and there's really no option because if it got worse, you know, you could end up dying. So the option was either do it or die. So it was an easy choice then. <laughs> <laughs> Bill had his left leg amputated. His next 1,000-mile journey would be without legs. The possibility of him taking any more steps in his lifetime looked bleak. So when I first met Bill, it would have been in the rehab setting. He had transferred to us from the hospital. Morgan White is a doctor of physical therapy. To say that the evaluation was easy or straightforward, that would be a total lie. He just had a lot of complications from the hospital with um, muscular stiffness, loss of range of motion, and complete immobility. He's what we would call a completely dependent resident at evaluations. He was not in his right mind. The only thing that he would repeat to me, he could tell me his name, okay, but when I would ask him any other questions, the only thing he would say to me on repeat was, I can't even say it without laughing. I'm just a big ham. I'm a big old ham. You're rolling me around like a big ham. They move you around with a Hoya lift. Mm -hmm. So you hanging up in the air. So I told I feel like a big ham hanging up in the air. Bill hated the lift. That was just extremely, extremely painful. He told Morgan as much. I said, well, we'll use a, a sliding board, which is just like a small wooden kind of a bridge between the bed and the wheelchair. And what people do is they use their arms to scoot out of the bed. It was a an eye-opening experience for him to where, okay, well, no, I don't have any of my legs, but I have the physical capability and the drive to want to be able to do this for myself and to have that independence. At that point, I, as a therapist, I started to realize, okay, well, maybe I've been you know, limiting my expectations with this gentleman. From the first impressions, you uh, you know, you knew it was going to be a long road from looking at him, but when you talked to him, you just, you know, you knew he was going to get there. Physical therapist assistant Charles McNeil worked with Bill along with Austin Williams. I tried to work with him at about 9.30 in the morning. Bill was like, oh, no, man, you got to come at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And once we set a relationship with each other, uh, we worked with each other about two, two and a half years. Um, coming down to the gym, he'd be the first one to wheel himself down only at one o'clock after lunch. Uh, at the end of, uh, you know, every other session or whatever, I'd say, okay, Bill, do you want to you try this or 
You want to do it one more time? And he always says, well, well, damn, I got to now. Bill, he's stubborn as a mule. It's that stubbornness and that drive to want to have that independence. And it wasn't even like just a, a lot of people will settle for, okay, well, if I can be independent from a wheelchair, then I'm fine. But that wasn't really good enough for him. He was like, I want to take this as far as I can possibly go. That meant getting out of the rehab facility and walking again. We had things where they had different exercises that we do, and they would be just to see how long I could stand up on my knees. Bill first learned to walk on stubbies, which are prosthetics that put you near the ground. Then he was approached with new technology. The prosthetic company that I met with told me that they had these new prosthetics with the computers in them. They said, you could probably be a good candidate for this. We kind of progressed in an uh, untraditional manner to get to where he's at right now. Charles McNeil said Bill would never be able to walk all by himself. We had to find it like a walker. We had to counterweight it to balance uh, while he's transitioning from sit to stand. So uh, once he's on his feet, you know, he, he uh, he does well. It took over two years for Bill to walk again. Bill proudly showed off his fancy electronic appendages inside his apartment. I asked him to give me a demonstration of his new legs. Bill takes his time putting on his leg socks and then strapping on the artificial limbs. I then act as his assistant to help him stand and lean on his walker. Okay. Okay, we go on three. And I'm pushing my legs down in the back of the prosthetic. Okay. All right. One, two, three. You can hear the prosthetics react to the movement. The next thing you know, Bill is standing and leaning on his walker. I move behind him with his wheelchair to make sure he doesn't fall backward. It's like that if you were standing at the roof of your house on two ladders, one one foot on one ladder, another foot on another ladder, and both of those ladders are swinging. That's what it's like. (laughs) And you're up in the air. Once Bill kicks his right leg out, the prosthetic acts just like a real leg. Yep, you sound like a robot. Yeah, a robot. That's pretty slick. His steps are small, but he can walk. Having that football background kind of gave him the insight of what he needed to do. So will Bill be able to fulfill his dream of walking onto the field at Saluki Stadium one more time? There are a lot of obstacles in his way, including other health issues. But you should not bet against Bill when he puts his mind to it. I think he's inspiring because he epitomizes what it means to not give up and to set goals. I would think his message would be always continue to push yourself, uh, keep a sense of humor about yourself, and don't punk out. The fact that we got to see like that final goal through fruition and this man that was living in a nursing home who we thought would be bed bound to actually get to go out and be independent in the community. Sorry, my maybe teary eyed, but to get to see him to go out and live, you know, he's got a new life. He's touched a lot of people. Yeah. And I know this is his goal, like he wants to reach other people. Um, It's really amazing. Bill Story's Thousand Mile Journey to Taking One Single Step is produced and written by me, Cleon Wall, with help from Whitney Sheffield. Music and post-production by Kevin West. Make sure you watch BYU TV's big stories by logging on to BYUSN.com. BYU Stories is a production of BYU Radio.